Yo and hello everybody and welcome to another episode of On The Fly with Mike and Tyson. <laughs> Tyson, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Mike. Well, it's, you know, usually, obviously Ty is here. However, there was a few weeks ago I had to be out of town and he had a couple guys fill in. You were on that show, I think, as a matter of yeah, fact. Yeah, that's like the last uh, time I was on. You're our pinch hitter, apparently. It's good. I like that role. When, when when things don't go the way you want, yeah, but Tyson's uh, not feeling great. He had a wisdom tooth pulled. I don't think he'd mind me telling everybody. And so he's just kind of dragging from that. <laughs> which, if we've all done it, it's like, ugh, yeah, I get it. It's no fun. Yeah. Um, but glad to have you here, man. Excited. Yeah. Fun to hang out with you, Mike. It was a pleasure. Just like our time in Montana was fun. Yeah, that was, uh, you know, you've been doing stuff on Bench Clear for – year and a half yeah pretty close to two years i think i've been yeah. kind of breaker culture bench clear two and a half years combined so somewhere in that range for sure and that was the first time we got to meet in person at the missoula show and that was just so much fun oh did, yeah did you see the results of the people voting on who did the best on the hundred dollar challenge yeah I, I learned that you have pretty good following so i just gonna... <laughs> loyal <laughs> loyal folks and, uh, <laughs> Yeah. I do love it. Although I, I love the card you picked up and uh, it was an NFL card, which is will lead into our first topic today because you picked an NFL Jerry Judy, I think. Is that right? Or yep. Jerry card? Judy, Teal Auto at 99, just sent that off to PSA. I won a couple spots for grading with a friend. So send that off and see how she does. So you'll get that, that back in, you know, 2025 and you'll be ready to go. <laughs> By then it'll be a superstar. Yeah, I know. No, uh, we got the NFL draft this week and I know – the hobby relevance, like how much does a hobby pay attention to the NFL draft? I, I think a little bit for the big football collectors because some, you know, people still like draft pick prism and those different things where they get different guys in different uniforms uh, just for fun, just to kind of get used to them. Um, in terms of this year, it's probably one of the lower years in terms of top quarterback. There's not a number one overall quarterback, which always kind of hurts the hobby realm because we know that quarterbacks drive the football aspect. Um, but I think it's just fun to see what teams do. I think there's going to, with what we've seen with trades and free agency so far, I think the draft's not going to disappoint. We still got Jimmy Garoppolo who could go somewhere. We still have some big quarterback moves and quarterback landscapes that need to be decided. And I, I think we might see that on draft day that kind of with some draft picks that might surprise us. One of the things I hate most about football collecting it, and I love the Cowboys. I am a huge football fan. People that watch my channel would know, you know, I love the Cowboys. I love college football. I'm a huge college football fan. Yep. And I love the sport. And I don't collect it. A ton. I have a few things in my collection that are football. But, like, I bought a Drew Brees rookie at, in Missoula, right? Yep. Yep. You were kind of jealous of that card. But point being... It's so quarterback heavy. That just bothers me that it's so quarterback driven, so quarterback heavy. You have great running backs and, you know, uh, other skill position players, linebackers, et cetera. To me, I just hate that it's so quarterback driven, I guess. Um, me too, 100%. That's kind of one thing that's been really tough for me as being a football collector and why I kind of like my nice baseball background of collecting as well is to kind of help mix it up a bit because you know even if you find a great up and coming receiver who has a all star season he's going to move a little bit but if a quarterback has two good weeks of 300 yards passing it's going to move a lot of bit so it's right. just you know it gets a little bit frustrating in that sense for sure i mean we know they're the most important positions a quarterback but it would be nice to see a little bit more value come into guys but you know jonathan taylor's doing pretty well there's a couple of guys that do pretty well uh just there's the top shelf quarterbacks and then kind of the rest for sure. Yeah. I mean, you bought that Jerry Judy card. He's a wide receiver, right? And he's an Alabama guy, right? Uh, he is. Yep. Okay. Um, lots of talent, all that kind of stuff. And the expectation of that card probably isn't, which is sad, right? I mean, I just, I don't, uh, just pisses me off, I guess, really, because <laughs> yeah. I would love to collect more football. And you don't have guys. I think the longevity of careers is so suspect. Yeah. Unless you're a quarterback, it's unlikely you're going to pay play 15 seasons. You know. Yeah. Uh, even 10 seasons is a long career for every other position other than like a really long career. 
and that makes it tough, I think, to create a – you can love it. Like, I love CeeDee Lamb, by the way, uh, for the Cowboys. I think he's a great dynamic wide receiver. With Amari Cooper gone, he's got to step up and be huge. Yep. But I'm not looking good to go buy – cd lamb cards if somebody gave a few to me i'd be happy but i'm not going to go out and spend my money on it that is that a common feeling for collectors uh yeah i think so for sure i I think it kind of goes to what you just said mike about it's really the injury scare football's a very dangerous sport contact every play for receivers or running backs to the sense that at some point they are going to injured. Judy got injured last year. He had a really bad high ankle sprain, which put him out for a while. And so quarterbacks are safer and they're more important of a position on a team. And so all the value just funnels into them because of those two, I think biggest two points. So that's pretty, it's pretty simple in that, that regard. If you were to think about, I just thought of this idea. I wonder, I want everybody to comment down below. I'm curious what people, what sport people will say percentage of fans people that would say they're a fan of the sport that are collectors of cards of that sport. And, and I know it's going to be a small number, no matter what sport you say, because not everybody's into cards. You're mo way more fans of every sport than there are collectors of the, each sport. But if you were to say, man, I'm a fan of this sport, what sport do you think would have the highest percentage of people that collect cards of that sport? So you're saying like you as a baseball fan that collects baseball cards, that percent, right. I think baseball would be the highest. I think basketball would be the highest. Oh, that's true. Yeah, basketball is a good one too. I just think that baseball is such like a, it's a, it's baseball's just got that viewership of just people just put it on while they're cooking. Like it's just, I think people are always kind of baseball fans. And so they just, to me, I think there's more of them watching. So I think that's why, but they might not be collecting cards the same. I guess I see your angle there. That's an interesting question for sure. I wonder what people are going to say in the comments. Yeah. I mean, and I, and you can be fans of multiple sports and collect multiple sports. Like that's not, I think that's not right. mutually exclusive. It doesn't have to be only one. I'm just saying, I think you would say fans of the sport, basketball would be number one. It'd still be 0.05% of the fans of that sport. I mean, it'd still be a minuscule number that collect the cards, but right. Uh, interesting thought. Yeah. That. I don't know. I would, I would close saying that I think football is probably the lowest. Right. Football's got a huge fan base, but not quite the hobby fan base. So, uh, I bet it's for sure the lowest. Maybe soccer, though, but soccer is not really a sport. No, is it? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, really coming on today. <laughs> Everybody's going to be like, what? No, of course, <laughs> soccer is a sport if you like zero zero ties. That's wonderful. Uh, <laughs> nobody actually wins. Uh, I'm hating on soccer, and I'm actually looking forward to the World Cup. Yeah. The US, US is going to have a pretty, actually, I think a pretty good team. Yeah, uh, kind of excited about that. Here we go. Talking about World Cup, NFL draft. Who's who's going to be the in in three years from now when we look back, who are going to be maybe the top two or three players hobby wise out of this draft? Yeah, I mean, with quarterbacks, as we kind of see, it really goes a fit. You know, you like, for example, if Malik Willis is probably the most uh, talented quarterback in terms of tools and size, he can run very like almost Dante Culper-ish Culpepper -ish with size um, that he can actually run. I mean, and I think if he goes to the Lions, you don't feel great about because the Lions haven't done a good job, great job with quarterbacks. So to me, it's all about size and fit. But I would say kind of the top three talents. It's a very kind of low class for running backs this year. So it's gonna it's a pretty heavy defensive class in terms of for the NFL sake. But I think Malik Willis is probably going to be one guy I would mention. Um, Kenny Pickett, if he gets with a team that uh, can really, he can just step in and play. Like if he gets to the Steelers, they have a lot of weapons. He could step in and be very productive. Uh, and then Chris Olave, Garrett Wilson, uh, Drake London, a couple big receivers if they get in the right fits, I think they'd be really good. So I would say in terms of talent, Malik Willis, Drake London, ugh, probably I really like Chris Olave. So I'd probably go with those three guys if I had to put three names down. Nice. Well, hey, you guys down below also tell us, you know, who do you, who are you looking forward to getting drafted? And that starts Thursday night or Wednesday yeah. night? I can't Thursday remember. night, 8 Eastern, and the second and third rounds on Friday. Right. Right. I like how they do it primetime now. I remember back in the day, it was all, you know, a Saturday, Sunday thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I like the primetime first Definitely. round. It, it is. It takes too long, but. Yep. It does take long with the clock and stuff, but. Um, I kind of wish the first night was first and second, and then they went third and fourth a bit, but that's just because the first round does happen faster than you think when you're really kind of going through the picks. Yeah, makes sense. 
Um, we had another thing I wanted to talk about today. I did a video about this on my channel, on Baseball Collector channel, earlier today, and I wanted to touch on it in, in much more depth and more how it relates to the hobby. We saw Miguel Cabrera get his 3,000th hit over the weekend, and I love milestones. I love especially the big ones, uh, you know, 3,000 hits, 500 home runs, 3,000 strikeouts for pitchers, 300 wins. It's funny how we've all adjusted our brain for pitchers. There's been this whole reset of what the expectations of a Hall of Fame pitcher are, mm -hmm. and what milestones and career achievements they need to have to be considered that. It it's funny over the and that's been over the last decade or so we've seen this. Oh, nobody's getting 300 wins again, so let's not make 300 wins something that's needed or just thought of, right? And we haven't done that much with hitters, quite frankly. Uh, and I think it's because over the last few years, we've still seen guys, Ichiro and Albert or, uh, Albert Pujols, Adrian Beltre, guys have still been reaching these milestones, A-Rod. Now, though, I think there there's an amazing point of time we're about to hit this next, I don't know, five to ten years of baseball with a gigantic drought in major milestones. And I'll make a point with this. Tell me, Miguel Cabrera hit 500 home, hit his 500th home run. He was the most recent guy to reach 500. Who's the next closest active player, Tyson, to getting to 500 home runs? This is a really tough one. I I, I don't. I'm gonna go just because he's been healthier, but I'm gonna go with like a guy like Paul Goldschmidt. Okay, incorrect. Okay. Uh, Believe it or not, it is Nelson Cruz. Oh, yeah. Cruz. That was yeah. good. Yeah. 451 homers. He's probably 63 years old, even though he, <laughs> I think it only says he's 40 or 41 or something, 42 maybe. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that Nelson Cruz gets to 500. He might, but yeah. he's got PED suspicions or not even suspicions. He was suspended. Um, right. But so he, his Hall of Fame candidacy is iffy. The next closest guy after Nelly Cruz at 451, Giancarlo Stanton. At oh, wow. 149. Okay. That's a long way. 150 homers <laughs> is a lot of injuries away from a guy, by the way, who's been injury prone his whole career. Well, not at least the last three or since he's been with the Yankees. Yeah. Stanton has not been super healthy. Right. I mean, yeah. Goldschmidt's not close. He's not even to 300 yet. That was no. Bad. <laughs> so, point being, it's unlikely we're going to see anybody get to 500 anytime soon. Right. And even if you're at 300 homers, you got to average 30 for a decade. Or, uh, I'm sorry, 30 for how many how many years would you have to average 30? If, uh, like eight years, six years, seven years, eight years, whatever. Right. Which means it's not happening anytime soon for a while. 500 home runs. How about 3,000 hits? Again, one of those benchmarks that everybody has said, man, if you get to 500 home runs, you're a lock for Hall of Fame. If you get 3,000 hits, you're a lock for the Hall of Fame. And I actually agree with that. I'm just that idea. I think milestones matter significantly because it points to excellence for a long period of time. Right. You don't just stumble into 3,000 hits. I'm sorry. You no. don't just accumulate 3,000 hits. You know, you, you have to be really good for a really long time. Yeah. Uh, but 3,000 hits. Guess who's next active player? And I'm discounting Robinson Cano on some of these lists, by the way, because he doesn't really count. He's never going to play again. But he's yeah. technically still active. But who would you say is next on the I road? Really, to I can't think of any of the older guys. Like, I'm just amazed. Look at this. You're just making such a good point because I just, I just looked at Bryce Harper out of curiosity, and he's at 1287. He's not even... <laughs> Not even halfway. So I'm not even – I have no solid guess for you on the hits. Yadier Molina mm. at 21-16. So he's 884 away, and he's already 39. He's not going to play, but maybe yeah. this season. Uh, I think he stayed around, really, just to play with Pujols again. He might play one more after this at the most. That's crazy. Next after him, Joey Votto, 2,035 hits. So he's almost a thousand away and he's already 38. Right. So no one's close. Where's Trout? 
I don't even know off the top of my head where Trout is. Trout is currently sitting at 1433. Okay, so he's halfway. So he has to do he has to replicate his his first 10, you know, plus a sliver of years over yeah. the next decade just to reach 3000 and that's a stretch, right? Yeah. Right. So when are we going to see yeah, that he's 30 now. He's 30 now. So I mean, if he could do another decade's work and really be healthy, which is also a big question mark. He is 1433 and 314 home runs. So it's going to be really tough to hit either of those. Yeah. I think 500 is more likely than yeah. 3,000 hits. Definitely. And, and I think what that will do, hopefully, is create an appreciation for the guys that have done it. Right. And I know it's, it's funny. We had this weird, you know, we had the steroid era and a lot of those accomplishments in, in a lot of fans minds are tainted right because they were enhanced right. to whatever degree that that might might have been true all of those players suspe suspected of that had periods where they weren't using obviously and then periods that they might have had some enhanced statistics and but yet i still think those numbers are magical i think they're important and you're not going to see one for a long time. And nobody's talking about that. I'm not hearing anybody talk about when's who's the next guy because it's not looking good. Right. And then, yeah, I mean, Miggy's almost 40. I took, and he's, you know, he has 2003s when he started his run. So he's almost, had almost 20 seasons to do it. And I think that's what you know, offline when we're talking to you about just seeing somebody consistently play baseball for 20 years is getting harder and harder to see. And yeah. so that, that, I mean, playing at a high level and doing it, that's the double negative. Like, how's that going to work for this ever happening or happening more, more happening more down the line? How's this going to keep happening? There's another huge part of it that we're not talking about either. It, the money has changed so much that why, why would somebody do that to their body yeah. for yeah. that period of time when you can make half a billion dollars over if you have a good 10 to 12 15 let's take mike trout right yeah he can sign i guess his deal is through i think he's signed with the angels forever but yeah. let me see i can't remember off the top of my head where he's yep. at for sure just the like you said just the idea of doing that like <laughs> the only thing i'd push back on that is that when you're really good at something, it's fun to keep doing. So, they, you know, it's not like football. I think the injuries is high, but I, I do think you're, you're making a good point. Somebody could just get that big first contract like Miggy did, but he kept going and cash in for sure. Yeah, I think about a guy like a younger talent, like a Mookie Betts, right? Or yeah. although Mookie's not younger anymore. Um, no. But you got Trout, is he's an unusual talent, right? He's a generational, he's the best guy to say, but I'm thinking, I'm thinking about these other guys that probably could get there if they needed to keep playing, mm -hmm. but none of them need to keep playing. They're going to have enough money for the rest of their lives, the rest of their children's lives, <laughs> assuming they don't do anything stupid, yeah. which don't, don't put it by them. But there's not this, I do agree with you. There's some internal drive to continue to be competitive, to continue to be at the top of your game and show that you're one of the best. Right. But it's just so much harder, I think. Um, yeah. So we're not seeing any of that stuff any time soon. Do you have a Cabrera rookie card, by the way? I don't, but it's on my list to get one. I know it's because his price hasn't really changed much. We talked about it in our flagship uh, podcast just this weekend. And it's it's baked in. Everybody knew he was going to get to 3000 and whatnot. Uh, but it's definitely one card I'd like to have because I think it's just like you said, he's these are not going to be very common going down the line for sure. I think the other thing too to think about too, Mike, is that it seems like more and more management of players is a bigger thing. Like, you know, four days off, one day off, like four days on, one day off consistently too. Guys aren't playing 162 games very often, even if they are healthy. And I think that that's a different mindset than it used to be as well. Yeah, great point. Yeah, if they play 140 games, that's considered a great, you know, hey, I played a full season. Uh, right. I have the Cabrera Chrome traded. Oh, Burt Beauty. Nice. Nine. And then I got, like last year, a uh, 2000 Tops just base signed at a, oh. at a signing. Oh, there you go. That's the way to do it. I like hey. it.
Um, he, his auto is not that expensive even yeah. now. I mean, you got to buy some Marlin stuff most likely to get it super cheap, but under a hundred bucks, yeah. you know, that, that feels cheap to me for who he yeah, is. I yeah. I saw some people okay. trying to sell a gold PSA nine rookie. And I thought the price was very cheap for a gold since it's a numbered rookie for him, which is very really tough to have. That's not like we have today. There's a lot of numbered rookies. It's kind of one of the main ones. So I think it was, I want to say it was like 700, 800. wasn't, wasn't very expensive for what I thought it was. Where would you rank Cabrera? I was trying to think of this earlier and I'll, I'll tell you my answer after I ask you, but where would you rank Cabrera in players you've seen play during your time as a baseball fan? Would, would you put him in the top 10? Is he top five? Is he not even on the list? Yeah, I think it's kind of tough because a lot of me, for me growing up the Northwest, like I saw Edgar, I saw Griffey a lot. I didn't see Cabrera like live a ton, just kind of growing up. Um, but I think he'd be top 10 in terms of just following the game for me. And I'd say maybe fringe five. If he's he'd be maybe five, six, four, right in that range for me, just kind of think off the top of my head. Yeah, I did this earlier on my other video, and I didn't say Griffey, and that was a huge mistake by me. <laughs> I would say Bonds is number one for me, yep. hands down. Yeah, Griffey, number two, pool holes. Uh, and it's not just me because I don't watch all these guys every day. It's just guys that I got to experience their career, if that makes sense, and yep. and see them do things at special moments and playoffs and whatever. Cabrera is in my top five. Yeah, where's where's Jeter compared to Cabrera? Oh, that's so unfair. <laughs> Jeter doesn't have the power, right? Right. But Jeter has a lot of rings on his fingers. Right. So I think Jeter was overrated, honestly. Uh, great that's player. Cool. Great yeah. player. First ballot Hall of Famer, no question. I would have voted for him, not even thought twice about it. It's not that he's not great. Uh, I think he was in a great circumstance yeah that made him greater uh you put him on the twins you know what i mean is yeah he, is he Derek jeter i mean right. that's always my point with if brady wasn't drafted by the patriots but i don't want to go down that rabbit hole <laughs> right <laughs> and that's not jeter's fault that he no, was drafted not, by the yankees i don't blame him one bit i don't it's no different than getting piped a fastball and you hit it at home run you did your job you did right. you maximize what you were supposed to do <laughs> right oh well he piped it that's not my fault he should have <laughs> right it's, yep i say that about like when they debate on larry walker todd helton well they play in coors well that's not their fault you're right that's who they drafted him i mean what are they supposed to do not hit 350 in coors mm -hmm. or whatever i don't you know it's this they can't you can't help where your what your circumstances are most of the time right jeter was in a great situation with a great supporting cast, no doubt. Great manager, Joe Torre, most of the time. You know what I mean? He 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 made the most of his circumstances, and good for him. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, I never absolutely. watched Jeter and said, ooh, one of the best players I've ever seen. Yeah, like, you know, the Bonds effect. I mean, yeah. Just right. Everything he swung was gone. It just That was an amazing time to watch baseball, for sure. But, yeah, definitely. Used or not, I don't care. Yeah. I enjoyed it enjoyed the heck out of it uh yeah. no one thought about it then you didn't care no everybody cares now how ironic yeah uh, and uh i'm doing my neck just uh as we wrap things up here this week i'm doing my uh golden age of cardboard episode on the changes in the hall of fame voting have you seen them i haven't no well then you'll have to watch this week's golden age of cardboard episode because i will go mm -hmm. through it i'm actually having a uh panel a group Ooh. of guys i usually don't do that it's usually either just me or me and another guy or whatever but nice. i thought this, this is such an important topic to me and i knew i have a bunch of friends that are very adamant or uh what's the word loud on the topic. <laughs> so it'll be fun to yeah. go through that do you have any behind the numbers coming up yeah so um i just recorded a i took baseball america's top 100 prospects list and i researched and dived down and got the hobby value for almost all hundred that there was cards for. And I ran through that with uh, Rob Kent, who I co-host with him on the flagship uh, rookie podcast as well. And then once ties better, him and I are going to record the top 100 uh, beginning of season MLB rookie list, uh, not top 100, so top 25 rookie list that I kind of update at. I usually do preseason uh, mid 
all-star break and then end of season kind of update. So I'm going to do the beginning of season update with Ty. So I know last week we talked, Ty and I talked about where's tops going to put this crop of rookies that are, you know, making scenes on the major league uh, landscape. Where do you think Bobby Witt falls and all these guys, where do you think they go? Suzuki. So my kind of take is that I'm going to play the international card that they're going to push Suzuki as hard as they can, like they did with Otani. So I think Suzuki will land in series two and have Chrome. Um, the only caveat to that is like they, we knew Otani was signed. Suzuki had kind of a little delay in signing. So that could change my tune, but I really think they're going to try hard to get him in there. I think they're going to go. Um, I think they're going to probably push back like Abrams and Torque. And I wouldn't be surprised if they split Witt and Julio. It's kind of my thing. I think that there's a, so many guys got called up. I just don't think that they want to put all of them in the tops chrome. They want to kind of do a little Soto move around. So I could see them splitting Julio and Witt is kind of my projection. I'm not sure which. Um, Cause I think I'm not who, sure who was more surprising that made it. I, I think, think Julio making it right. So and his stay might be very short. Yeah. I'm pretty confident he's going to stay up. Uh, we talked about it just on the show on Saturday. Um, he has so far, he has nine strike three calls that were not strikes <laughs> to his, to his name. And like his plate discipline has been incredible. I've watched every at bat as a Mariners fan and he is getting the bad end of the stick right now when it comes to the umps. And I think four of those strike three calls were full counts. So you take that flop, his OBP and a lot of different numbers look a lot better than they actually are. So, and he's still in the top 75 percentile for hard hit rate. So he, he's still doing okay, but his numbers do look terrible. He's got a 45% K rate at what's going on, but it's not quite what you think is my point. <laughs> so, but yeah, I, I'm, what do you think? What do you guys, what do you guys say? Oh, I, I think they're going to split it because they want to make both products amazing they're going to put them all in this year i don't think right. there's any you know wander effect where they push them out yep on 2022 because tops is going to make hay while they yep. can't pre-fanatics you know fanatics is taken over but they haven't really taken over yet you know they haven't and i keep my kind of messaging around the wax for i know everybody's getting super excited because all the names to get in there but print runs are still high it's not it just planned to be disappointed in the sense of I, my point was is that right now a hobby box of tops chrome is 500 dollars pre-sale okay let's circle back 2018 chrome who has acuna soto or not soto acuna otani a really nice class is going for a thousand dollars now so you can't you you know you have studs in that class like it's just it's not where it needs to be to be effective for us in the hobby so i'm a little a little bit nervous on the wax that people are jumping at spy singles yeah buy singles do breaks in an affordable way whatever you can do to kind of isolate your your uh cost well tyson thanks for being my pinch hitter today for ty anytime he'll watch this and i'm sure he'll text both of us and say we did a a bang up job in his stead but uh yeah thanks for doing this uh it kind of sure. like literally on the fly i'm texting you this afternoon going hey yep. <laughs> can you be on the show because ty's not feeling great <laughs> yeah i appreciate you stepping up yeah, for sure, man. Got the text in period four calculus class. And so that's why I'm in my uh, professional attire. But hey, stepping in when I have to. <laughs> I appreciate it, my friend. Yeah, buddy. Uh, everybody have a great one out there and uh, keep collecting. We'll see that's you guys right. soon. See ya.